get to come and worship something, someone who is that amazing and that mighty and that great. And we remember his birth with such songs as this one. Oh, come, all ye faithful, joyful and triumphant. Let's stand together and sing. <laughs>
chapter 9 over the next uh, four weeks. And in fact, when you come back on the first Sunday of the new year, I'll be preaching a sermon from uh, uh, that text as well, from uh, chapter 9 and chapter 10. So we're actually going to be in this section of Scripture for about five weeks. So Isaiah chapter 6, and we're going to be spending our Christmas this year with Isaiah. So that's, that's what we're, we're doing. We're going to spend our Christmas with Isaiah. He invited us over. He sent me a card. I said, hey guys, what you doing on Christmas? I said, nothing, Isaiah. He said, well, come on over. And I said, okay, I'm there. And so we're going we're gonna to celebrate Christmas with Isaiah over the next few weeks. I do have some news to share with you. If you could put the first slide up. Um, we have been praying uh, our, some of our State of the Church prayer requests that began January of last year. Now, those of you who weren't here for the State of the Church meeting, or if you're not following the Wednesday night updates, which is kind of where I've been trying to keep everybody up to date on what's going on in the church, you see those what is, the lines through that uh, means that it's been answered, right? That's good news. Um, well, this week, um, we can put a line through that one if you'll show the next slide. Yes, so we are now below 400,000. And it's only December 4th. So what this means is we might as well just go ahead and hit 350 while we're at it with the Lord's help, right? Yeah. And I'll share more with you later when we get into January with the State of the Church when I can show you what, where our debt went this year. Um, as far as our debt, this is our debt on the multi-purpose building. Some of you may be new here. This is a note we've been carrying since uh, around 2010. And uh, one of the things that uh, we wanted to do uh, very quickly is try to get rid of this debt as quickly as possible. And then even quicker than that. And the Lord has been good to us these last three years. And amazingly, even through all of COVID, you guys have been faithful to give. Because if you hadn't been faithful to give, we wouldn't be able to continue to do ministry and continue to do that. And the Lord has been faithful. He has shown up and uh, done things that we couldn't have done that. The Lord did. And, uh, and if we get to 350 before the end of the year, uh, that's something only the Lord could do. And, I, you know, I owe me of little faith. I put 400,000. Uh, well, I should have put 350, I guess. But that's where, so December 4th, we've got the end of the year. And then, of course, we've been giving out of our general treasury as, as money has been available and as far as our budget is concerned. So we've been able to give from our general treasury in addition to your PRC gifts um, and we're hoping to make another one of those in early January if our, Jan if our December numbers are where they need to be. So this is, this is great news, church. This is good news. This isn't, listen to me, listen to me. This isn't someone being saved. This isn't someone who's out of church getting back in church and get connected with the Sunday school class. This isn't a baptism. But it does matter. And it's a blessing. This isn't the main thing. God didn't call us here to build buildings and pay them off. He called us to make disciples, okay? So this is, this is secondary, but boy, that's good news and exciting, all right? So anyway, I wanted to share that good news with you. I know this has been a hard week for everyone. Uh, this is going to be a hard Christmas season for everyone. We've lost a lot of folks this year, and even, uh, well, we haven't lost them. I, I say that. We haven't lost them. We know exactly where, where they are. They're with the Lord. Um, but it, I know this is a hard Christmas season. But hopefully as we go through the book of Isaiah, uh, chapters 6 through 9, uh, you'll find some hope and some encouragement. So as I said earlier, Isaiah has invited us over for Christmas. How many of you have gotten your first Christmas cards for the year? Yeah. So I was barely finishing my turkey and dressing for the third time on Friday or Saturday after Thanksgiving when I, I looked at my mailbox and there's a card. Oh, what's that for? Oh, it's Christmas. And... I don't remember who was first, but you know who you probably are, uh, it, and it just makes me feel so disorganized and guilt-ridden, because here they are, the day, after, the day after Thanksgiving, and I'm getting a Christmas card from them. Um, I, I, that's just amazing. Some of you are very organized about that. So let's just imagine you went to your mailbox next week, and you had an invitation to come back in time 700 years before the birth of Christ, 700 years before they even knew what his name would be. 700 years before they would know exactly where he would be born. Micah's going to tell us that information later. Imagine being invited to celebrate Christmas with the prophet Isaiah. I wonder what that would have been like 700 years before Jesus was born. Well, that's what we're going to do. 
Long before they knew his name, they all, had, all they had were promises and prophecies that one day a child would be born. A child would be born that would redeem and save Israel. A child linked to the promises of Abraham and to the promises of David the king. He would be a gift to Israel and a gift to the world. And we're going to celebrate Christmas with Isaiah this year and learn who this gift and who this God really is. Let's, let's begin by reading our text, Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 13. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above it stood seraphim. These are angelic, powerful, glorious beings that God created for the purpose of praise. Each one had six wings. With two, he covered his face. With two, he covered his feet. And with two, he flew. And one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Okay, now I'm saying it that way because this isn't holy, holy. What the seraphim, is, what they are saying in this text, Isaiah says that it's literally shaking the rafters of the heavenly temple. This isn't a quiet, meek, little, mild worship. This is holy, holy, holy. And the whole earth is just filled up and overwhelmed by His glory. And the posts of the door were shaken by the voice of Him who cried out. Not the voice of God. God's not even speaking yet, right? This isn't God raising Him. This is just a created being in the presence of God who is raising her voice. And the house was filled with smoke. So I said, Woe is me, for I am undone. Kill me now. Destroy me. I can't see this. I can't live through this. I am undone. Well, why is he so undone? Because I am a man of unclean lips. And I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. And again, he says, for my eyes have seen the king. Not King Uzziah. Not King Jotham. Not King Ahaz. Not even King David. My eyes have seen the king. And he's the Lord of heaven's armies. Then one of the seraphim flew to me. Having in his hand a live coal. This is a burning coal from one of the altars. Altar of incense, an altar of sacrifice, we don't know. And he uses tongs to pick it up. And he uses tongs to pick this up, not because it's hot, because seraphim, literally translated, just means burning ones. It's not going to burn the, the one who's in the presence of God. He's picking it up because it's holy. It's coming from the altar of incense. It's coming maybe from the altar of sacrifice in this heavenly temple. And he takes it with tong, those tongs and he carries this living coal from the altar and he says, verse 7, and he touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. And Isaiah died and slept with his fathers. Now that's what you would expect when a sinful man comes in contact with the holiness of God. But that's why this passage has such a beautiful Christmas shape to it. <laughs> Behold, this has touched your lips. Your iniquity has been taken away, forgiven. Your sin has been purged, literally atoned for in the Old Testament sense, not in the New Testament sense. It's been covered over. Because we know that all of the pictures of salvation in the Old Testament, including this one, are simply pictures and symbols of what's coming. When holy, holy, holy God sacrifices himself for sin. And he's willing to come and touch and to heal us sinners. And to not just cover up our sins, but completely atone, pay for, and purge them. And then because of this great event that's happened to Isaiah, he's not, no longer just hearing the seraphim. Now he is hearing, verse 8, whom... Excuse me, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? 
<laughs> my wife is telling me, you have a big card in your back pocket. <laughs> this is another Christmas card. <laughs> uh, sorry about that. <laughs> Yes, that's where we're at. Thank you. That's, that's where we were at. Verse, verse 8. I heard the verse, voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? Isaiah looks around and says, I'll go. Here I am. Send me. You didn't kill me. You cleansed me. So send me. I'll go and tell them. He doesn't even know what he's going to tell him yet. He doesn't even know how long his ministry will be. He doesn't know any of the results because he's getting ready to find out his ministry is going to be very difficult, hard, and it's going to be long. But Isaiah just says, I'm going to give my life to this one sitting on the throne who's cleansed me and purged me. and I, I'm going to go. You send me. And then verse 9, he said, go and tell this people. Not tell my people. We've moved beyond that. By the time you come to the book of Isaiah, the northern kingdom, Israel, is headed to judgment. In just a few years, we're talking, by the time Ahaz comes on the throne, we're talking 15 years. So very early in the ministry of, of uh, Isaiah, about 15 or 20 years into the ministry of Isaiah, the northern kingdom is going to be overrun by the Assyrians. He's going to go on and also talk about the fact that not only is the northern kingdom going to fall, but the southern kingdom is going to fall too. It's going to be about 120 years later, but they are going to fall. They are going to fall to the Babylonians in 586. So this, this, this ministry that he has is going to be a difficult one because these people aren't acting like the people of God. In fact, God says in a kind of sarcastic way, this is what I want you to tell them, Isaiah. Keep on hearing, but you still don't understand. Like you keep showing up and listening... But you're not getting it. You keep on seeing, but you don't perceive. Oof. So they can't hear, and they can't see spiritually. And then, it's a very poetic verse 10. He says, make the heart of this people dull, one, their ears heavy, two, and shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes. See how it reverses? One, two, three, now we're going three, two, one. Lest they see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and return, or repent, and be healed. So Isaiah, I would like to tell you that when you go and preach, thousands will come and repent and believe in me and trust me. And he says, that's not what is going to happen. In fact, your preaching is going to be an instrument of judgment upon the people. As you preach, their ears are going to become even more heavy and dull and hardened. Their hearts are going to be hardened. Their eyes will be even more blinded. Now, church, I'm just going to go ahead and tell you right now, if you come to church week after week after week and you hear and you hear and you hear and you do not respond, I'm telling you, you are in danger. Because the same word that softens a heart and brings a heart to repentance can also harden one. And if you keep resisting and you keep saying no, eventually, what God will do? He will honor your willing choice. And that is such a sad place to be. That's where the nation of Israel was. They were at the point where repentance wasn't going to happen unless judgment and discipline came. <laughs> Whew. Merry Christmas. <laughs> you know, Isaiah, of course, he asked a good question in verse 11, right? Well, okay, so how long am I going to do this? Just, just ballpark it. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm like, they're not going to listen, they're not going to hear, and the more I preach, the worse it's going to get. Yep, that's what's going to happen. Um, how long? I, I'm willing to go, I just, how long? <laughs> Oof. Listen to this. Until the cities are laid waste and without inhabitant, the houses are without a man, and the land is utterly desolate. The Assyrians and the Babylonians are coming the Lord has removed, not, not, not those other armies, but the Lord has removed men far away. Captivity's coming. And the forsaken places are many in the midst of the land. Just an empty shell of houses and homes, a destroyed temple, all of those things. But then, in the middle of this difficult message that he's going to be preaching, and, and verse 13 is a little difficult to understand, but just understand what he's saying in this. I just want you to understand what he's saying in this verse. Yet, yet a tenth will be in it. 
That tenth is a tithe. It's a remnant. That is, Jesus, or the Lord is telling Isaiah as he's uh, talking about his ministry that there will be people who survive my judgment and discipline. There's going to be a remnant. There's going to be a tenth. There's going to be a group of people that will respond, that will repent, that will not only rebuild the city and the temple, but also be there when Jesus comes on the scene. And in fact, even though the land will be like a... Have you ever seen a clear cut? Have you seen a clear cut? And then have you ever seen where after a clear cut or, or maybe after a, a fire, what, what it looks like and you've just got stump after stump after stump and it's just smoking and smoldering? You've ever seen that? That's what he's describing is going to happen to the nation of Israel. It's going to be laid waste and desolate and there's just going to be these stumps. But listen to what he says in verse 13. The holy seed shall be its stump. And the point of that is simply this. That in the ruin and devastation of God's judgment, there's going to be a seed of holy people and a seed of the promise of Jesus in that stump. We're going to, if you go on in the book of, of Isaiah, you'll find that, that message in Isaiah chapter 11. So God gives Isaiah this ministry. Let's pray. Father, we just ask you to give us ears to hear, eyes to see. Give us hearts that are willing to not just hear, but to do what Isaiah did. Help us to be willing to go and to tell, in Jesus' name. And everyone said? This is Isaiah's call to become a prophet here in chapter 6. And this is right at the end of the reign of Uzziah. And I want to give you kind of a, a, a picture of what was going on politically and uh, spiritually and economically at this time. So at the end of Uzziah's reign, which was about 50 years, there were two kings, one in, in the south, in Judah, one in the north, in the northern kingdom. And both of those kings reigned about 50 years. Assyria wasn't really bothering either. They weren't really bothering the northern kingdom. The Assyrians weren't bothering the southern kingdom. Egypt was powerless. And so for about 50 years, as you come into this period of history, they were prosperous. They had chariots. They had money. They had wealth. They had economic. They built their houses. They built their lands. Things were as good as they had been probably since the heyday of Solomon. And Uzziah was a great king. He served faithfully, except for his pride at the end of his reign. He was a great king, and he was the greatest king that Israel had had since the days of Solomon. But that would soon change. With Uzziah's death and then Jotham giving way to Ahaz, Assyria would begin threatening. Syria and Israel were putting pressure on Judah to join an alliance with them. And politically there was pressure, politically there was fear, there was turmoil within the country. So there were pro-Assyrians in the government, there were anti-Assyrians in the government propping up their kings and propping up their vassals. There were infighting in the southern kingdom. And spiritually the nation of Judah was in free fall. After all of that prosperity and all that blessing, listen to chapter 1. Look back to chapter 1, because if you don't see this, it, it won't help us to understand what's going on here. Verse 2. And I just, I can't read all the verses, but I just want you to see the verse 2 of chapter 1. Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord has spoken. Israel, Judah, will not listen to God. So he turns to the nations and says, maybe you Gentiles will listen. Maybe the rest of the earth will listen. Nobody else has listened to me, he says. I have nourished and brought up children, and they have rebelled against me. The ox knows its owner, the donkey its master's crib, but Israel does not know. My people do not consider. Isaiah says, alas, sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, a brood of evildoers, children who are corruptors. They have forsaken the Lord. They have provoked to anger. Who? This is the first time he uses this title in the book of Isaiah. It becomes Isaiah's favorite title for God in the book of Isaiah. You have moved the Holy One of Israel to anger. And they have turned away backward. Look at verse 10. Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of what? He just called the Davidic dynasty rulers in Sodom. That's wicked. That's perverse. Wow. 
Give ear to the law of our God, you people of Gomorrah. To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices to me, says the Lord? I have had enough of burnt offerings and rams and the fat of fed cattle. I do not delight in the blood of bulls, blood of bulls or of lambs or goats. Whew. Look at verse 21. How the faithful city, Jerusalem, he likens David's city, the city of the great king, to a prostitute. That's pretty bad. That's wicked. It was full of justice. Righteousness lodged in it, but now murderers. Well, that sounds like a country I know. Whew. Your silver has become dross. Your wine mixed with water. Your princes are rebellious and companions of thieves. Everyone loves bribes and follows after rewards. They do not defend the fatherless, nor the cause of the widow. Hmm. When you come to chapter 5, let me sum up for you the, the argument that, that Isaiah makes. Chapter 5 and verse 24. Let me, let, me, let me cut to the very root of what was going on here and what Isaiah is going to address in his whole book, all 66 chapters. Therefore, as the fire devours, devours the stubble, verse 24, the flame consumes the chaff, so the root will be as rottenness and their blossom will ascend like dust because they have what? They have rejected the law of the Lord. They will not listen. They will not obey. They will not respond to the revealed word of God, preached prophetic word of God, the law of Moses and the law of the Lord of hosts. And they have despised the word of the Holy One of Israel. So, into that kind of culture... <laughs> And into that kind of wickedness, that kind of depravity, that kind of darkness, that kind of immorality, God calls Isaiah to be a prophet. How many of y'all are signing up for that one? <laughs> I like preaching here. You know why I like preaching in here? Y'all may not like me. I'm sure that's the case. But here's the thing. Y'all love Jesus. And so you got to love me because you love Jesus. It's just the way it works, Right? I mean, it could go bad in our relationship, but chances are up here preaching and in fellowship with you, this is a pretty safe place for me to get up and get red-faced and preach about things, right? That was not what I was going to experience. No one was going to, amen, preach it, brother. Oh, no, that wasn't getting ready to happen at all. And it begins with the word wow. <laughs> when you look at chapter 6, the first thing Isaiah experiences is Wow. Verses 1 through 4 describe a life-changing vision of God and His holiness. And Isaiah puts this right here to point out that this, this experience with the holiness of God and this vision changed Isaiah. He was now going to call, I mean, he was, he's, his favorite title, as I said, and one of his favorite titles in the, in, in the book of Isaiah is the Holy One of Israel. He, he's never going to be outrun, or never going to be able to outrun this vision that he has of God in this chapter. It is going to change him forever. And by the way, this is one of the reasons why we are so anemically, spiritually immature and poor. Because we have not had a great vision of the holiness of God. We're too busy looking in the mirror. So what did Isaiah see that made this a wow experience? Look at the first phrase. I saw the Lord. And he bookends it. Look down in verse 4. He says it again. Excuse me, down in uh, verse 5. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Now, whenever you see Isaiah uh, mentioning that he sees the Lord, he's seeing a vision of the Lord. He's not seeing God and uh, his, his complete revealed glory. Okay, that, that's not what we have here. We have mediated glory. He's going to see a vision of the glory of God. He's going to see parts of God. He's not going to see his face because guess what? God doesn't have a face. <laughs> right? Not until Jesus comes on the scene does God have a human face. You with me? Well, if you're not with me, you need to get with me because that's who your God is. Our God is a spirit. Right? So what we're seeing here is a vision of the grandeur and the majesty of God, and it is, well, one word, wow. First of all, he's sovereign. He's sitting on a throne. And he's not worried about how the universe is playing out. 
He's not wondering if his plans will come true. He is seated on a throne, above time, transcendent, ruling, reigning. He's exalted, he's high and lifted up. And so, get the direction. Isaiah's not looking eye to eye with the king of heaven, he's looking up. And he's also immense. Look, look at this in verse 1. He's not describing God in this verse, is he? He's describing what he's wearing. Like Isaiah has, I can't, I can't describe God to you, but let me, just, let, me just, let me just focus on one thing. You know the part of his robe, the bottom hem, that very end of his hem? That part of his robe filled up the whole temple. That's how big, that's how immense, that's how overwhelming God is. Just his robe, just the hem of that garment is filling up the whole heavenly temple as Isaiah looks up. Now that's pretty amazing when you are awestruck by the hem of someone's garment. <laughs> I mean, have you ever walked along and said, man, what a shirt. Look at that hem. That is fantastic. Well, of course not. But when you're looking at the God of all creation, the Lord of hosts, and you're allowed to see him sitting in his heavenly temple, all Isaiah could do is, okay, uh, let's go with, the, let me explain that. <laughs> in verses 2 through 4, we're introduced to the seraphim. And, the, and again, we're not, he's not describing God here in verses 2 through 4. He describes the seraphim who are then telling us about God. You see how he mediated through the seraphim? And even the seraphim, aren't experiencing the full, unbridled glory of God. These seraphim, these burning ones who have been created to worship God and to be around the throne, they have wings. And you know what they do with a pair of those wings? They cover up their... Even though they are holy, even though they were made to worship, even though they are sinless, they aren't allowed to look at the Holy One of Israel. And we're going to walk in here unprepared. We're going to walk through life acting as if God is this little thing, little person we can manage in case of emergency, break glass, get out little Jesus in a manger and we, we pet him and we, we use him. No, no, no. This is the God of heaven's armies. <laughs> He's immense. God seated on the throne and these, cher these uh, seraphim are seated uh, are standing Above the throne, and even though they're holy, all they can do is speak. And here's what they say. They describe God as holy, holy, holy. Now let me make sure you understand what's being conveyed here. In the Hebrew language, to communicate superlatives, which means the bestest of the bestest. Okay, the, you English teachers just had a conniption, I know. Uh, but if you're going to go superlative in the Hebrew language, they don't have that. So you repeat it. So the angels that are trying to explain to Isaiah who God is, they didn't just say he's holy. No, he's holy, holy, holy. You can't measure him. You can't manage him. You can't put him in a box. You can't understand him. He is inscrutable. You're not going to figure him out. He is holy, holy, holy. The language here is meant to convey how beyond our comprehension the Lord is. The sovereign Lord of heaven's armies is heaven, is holy, holy, holy. He is morally pure. He's ethically pure. He is awesome. He is perfect. And he is sacred. We just studied the Sermon on the Mount. Our Father who art in heaven, your name is common just like everybody else's. No. No. Yeah, what do we put on Facebook? OMG. <laughs> you realize what you're saying when you say that? You're taking the name of the Holy One and you're reducing him to an exclamation point on a Facebook post? I don't think we know who we're talking about here. We use empty language like that. No, no, this, this God is holy. Holy, holy. And the cool thing about this is what, what he's trying to, one of the things that holiness communicates is that, okay, so there's God, with me? God, and there's everybody else. 
Everybody else and everyone else, we're just common. He's other. There is no one like him. He's not like you. He's not like me. Especially now that we're broken and in our sin, we're even less like him, right? This is who Isaiah was seeing. This is who the seraphim were worshiping. He's above, beyond, incomprehensible. And in verse 5, he's overwhelming. The message of the seraphim is that the whole earth is filled with the glory of God. Now, I don't have time. The glory of God is a whole sermon series and all this. Just understand, the Hebrew word means weighty. So if you think about, like if you can measure the weight of God's majesty and how much he would weigh, like how much that would weigh, how heavy that would be. And, and, and Isaiah is seeing, hearing this, this, this statement from the seraphim that's saying, the whole earth is just burdened down with the glory and the magnificence of God. He weighs the whole earth down with his glory. The voices of the seraphim are so loud. Not God's voice, but the, these angelic beings, these seraphim, are so loud that they're literally shaking the posts and door thresholds of the temple itself. Listen to the words of these songs. You can sing with me if you know it. I see the Lord seated on His throne Exalted the train of His robe Fills the temple with glory And the whole earth is filled The whole earth is filled Yes, the whole earth is filled With His glory I'll sing it with me I see the Lord Seated on his throne, exalted, the train of his robe fills the temple with glory, and the whole earth is filled, and the whole earth is filled, the whole. that wow turns to a woe. Because in verse 5, when he saw, it turned into a woe. And that woe is a very simple. When Isaiah saw the Lord for who he is, and as a result, he saw himself for who he was. And he says two things about himself. I am undone. This vision of God devastated him. Here, here, he said, boy, I, could just, I, I, I wish God would just show up and we're just, you know, almost everyone who sees the glory of the Lord in the Bible, before and after the cross, end up on their face. <laughs> John, John, in his old age after following Jesus all those years, he was the beloved one of Jesus. When he saw the glorified Christ on the Isle of Patmos to get that vision, he fell at his feet as if he were dead. And Jesus comes, I'm not going to kill you. <laughs> I've forgiven you. I love you. What are you doing down there? And then he sends John with his message, right? I am undone. Instead of presuming upon God's grace, well, God has to forgive me. No, 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 no. God doesn't have to forgive you. <laughs> he is not compelled. You don't tell the God of the universe what to do, what to think, how to respond. We don't presume upon his grace. We are undone before him. And what he does with us is up to him. That's where Isaiah started. <laughs> that doesn't sound like us in 21st century America, does it? He also says, I'm unclean. In fact, he says, I have unclean lips. Now, one writer asked the question, why, why does he talk about unclean lips when the whole book of Isaiah is about their unclean heart, that the issue was their heart? Why did he talk about lips? Well, just think about what he just saw. He just watched these beings in the presence of God. And what was their one job? 
Their one job was to drop their jaw and to lift a thunderous voice of praise. Holy, holy, holy. And Isaiah saw that and said, I can't do that. My lips are too unclean to let those words come across them. I'm not allowed to join that choir. I'm not allowed to do that work. I'm not just undone. I am unclean. And in fact, he lived among a bunch of unclean people. We just read about that, right? Even King Uzziah. So this, uh, this is, this is a, important to notice. King Uzziah was the best thing they had since Solomon. He was the best king. He ruled for 50 years. He had a great run. And at the end of that run, he decided he wanted to be a priest. And lifted up in pride, he decided he knew better than God. And you know what God had to do with Uzziah? He struck him down with leprosy, which caused him to be separated from his throne and walk around the rest of his days unclean. You see, the kings of the earth, on their best day, unclean. Do not put your hope in any king, president, or governor. Because on their best day, and on our best day, unclean. <laughs> now let's, let's make sure we get the order here. Isaiah sees God. Isaiah sees his own sin. And then Isaiah sees the sin of his culture. Here's what we like. Here's what I like to do. I like to not look at God's holiness, because that's too convicting. I like to look at you and to look at others and to look at the culture and rag about how unrighteous they are. And then bring a, a weak, self-righteous prayer to God about the, the sin of our culture. And that's not the order. The order is God, His vision, His holiness, my sin, the sin of the people around me. And here we are before God and we're hopeless, we're devastated and there's nothing we can do. So the wow turns into a woe. And then if you're in the old King James, the woe turns to a low. Now if you're in the new King James, it's behold. Look at verses 6 and 7. That's what, the, that's what the seraphim said to Isaiah in verse 7. Behold, this has touched your lips. So this woe is turned into behold. And, and here is where it takes a turn. Here is, is, is where we see a Christmas gracious shape in Isaiah's experience. Isaiah and his people deserve judgment, death, and banishment from the Holy One of Israel. And instead he discovers forgiveness and cleansing. This is who God is. This is who God is. Are you hearing me, lost person? You can't fix it. You're lost. You're cut off. You're in danger. This God who is holy is also a judge. But let me tell you, the same God who can judge you and banish you from his presence in eternal hell can also give you forgiveness, cleansing, grace, and mercy. Because he did that for Isaiah. He did that for me. Behold, he says, this has touched your lips. Now, think about that. Isaiah is a sinner. Isaiah has unclean, sinful lips. So God allows the seraphim to take what is holy, represents the holiness of God, and cauterize that sin of Isaiah. You see, Isaiah expected the holiness of God to slay him. But the holiness of God actually saved him. He expected the holiness of God to, to kill him. But the holiness of God actually heals him. And he says it this way, Your iniquity is taken away, forgiven. Behold, your sin is purged, atoned for, covered up. And we know that this was a temporary picture of a permanent fix that's coming in the New Testament, right? Right? This is a picture of what Jesus does for us on the cross. This is a picture of his atoning sacrifice of grace and mercy. One, one, one uh, writer said it this way, God's holiness didn't kill Isaiah. In forgiveness and atonement, the holiness of God healed him. When we respond to the holiness of God with repentance, he can heal us. Sinners like Isaiah, who are undone and unclean, can be forgiven and purified and allowed to be in the presence of holy Holy, holy. But the low turns into go. 
Verses 8 through 13 covers the commission that he has given. As a result of this act of mercy, and here's the problem with this passage. Most preachers stop at verse 7. And they don't give you the full picture. Because this isn't just about getting your sins purged and getting forgiven. This is about somebody presenting themselves as a servant of the Lord. God didn't save us so that we could just go to heaven. He saved us so that he might use us as an instrument of his glory and his will. And so God's having this conversation in heaven so that, you know, the, the seraphims and, 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 and now Isaiah can hear God speak. In the middle of all of that going on, he hear, hear God and God asks the question, who are we going to send? Who am I going to send? Who will go for us? Now hold on to that idea. So God's in heaven, right? The Lord of hosts, he, Isaiah has to be given a mediated vision so he can just see a little bit of the glory of God, right? And so God is asking, who am I going to send to tell them about me, about my will, about my word, who I am? Who am I going to send? And Isaiah says, I'll go. Send me. Have you said that yet? What do you mean? You're talking about being sent? No, I'm talking about after your salvation, have you laid your life on the altar and said, use me for whatever purpose you have on this earth until the day I die. Here I am. Send me. Well, no, I'm just trying to have a good life. No, no, no. (laughs) You haven't seen the holiness of God if that's all you're trying to do. (laughs) We haven't been given a vision of how good and glorious and wonderful, how gracious and kind and merciful He is because when we really get a hold of that vision, there's only one response. Lord, here I am. Send me. It's called writing a blank check and letting God fill out the details. Go. And he told them to go and to tell, even though in verses 9 and 10, God promises him in irony and sarcasm that they're not going to listen. It's going to be a tough ministry, Isaiah. He also explains that judgment is coming in verses 11 and 12 for the northern kingdom and then for the southern kingdom. He also gives just a little bit of hope in verse 13 that the holy seed shall be its stump and there will be this remnant that will survive the judgment and discipline of God. Now when you look at this commission of Isaiah, did you know that this, not the first seven, not the first seven verses, but, but when you get down into verses 9 and 10, this is one of the most often quoted verses or passages in the New Testament. In fact, you'll see on the screen... Where it's used. It's used in Matthew 13. Where, remember when Jesus got to that point in his ministry and they weren't responding to him anymore? And he started telling parables because he liked telling stories. Jesus liked telling stories. You know, he's a good storyteller. And he was. But that's not why God instructed Jesus to tell parables. He told parables to conceal truth from people who really didn't want to hear it. If you have a heart that will not respond to God, why would he reveal anything to you at all? Like if in the end you're just going to say no, why would God give you the opportunity? <laughs> That's exactly what happened. Jesus told parables so it would be like, a, like, a, like, a, like a, a filter. And the people who heard the parable and didn't understand them, like all the apostles, they would come to Jesus after the crowds left and say, Jesus, um, now I know the rest of the guys know, but could you explain the parable to me? I don't really understand it. Why? Because they had a heart that wanted to know. So it's used in in Mark and Luke. Paul uses it in Acts 28 at the end of the book of Acts to describe turning away from the Jews because they will not believe and receive Jesus and turning to the Gentiles. Now, I want you to look with me in John chapter 12 because I I want to focus on the usage of it here in John chapter 12. And I want you to see uh, verse 31. As you get into chapter 13 of John's gospel, Jesus is going to wash the disciples' feet. There's going to be the upper room discourse, then he's going to be arrested. This is the night of his, or of, uh, his final night with his apostles, right? Verse 31, this is Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Acts in the letter to the Romans. Uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, chapter 12. Look at verse 31, now is the judgment of the world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. And if I, 
and I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all peoples to myself. He's talking about the crucifixion, right? The crucifixion that's coming. This he said, signifying by what death he would die. The people answered him. So Jesus is telling them about this. We have heard that from the law that Christ remains forever. And how can you say the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? Translation, who, who do you think you are? Explain this to us. Then Jesus said, a little while longer the light is with you. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness overtake. You. He who walks in darkness does not know where he is going. While you have the light, believe in the light, that you may become sons of the light. These things Jesus spoke and departed, and was what? I thought Jesus wanted to save everybody. He does. But some people refuse, and they refuse, and they refuse. And God judges that unbelief. He did it to the nation of Israel. Look at what Look at verse 37. But although he had done so many signs before them, they did not believe in him. So this is what Isaiah is talking about. This is, this is what Jesus happened in the ministry of Jesus. God gave them ample opportunity and proof through the words and the works of Jesus to believe in who Jesus was, and they did not. Not they could not. They would not. Here's the danger. If you keep wood nodding, it turns into a could not. Because that's what he says. That the word of the Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled, which he spoke, Lord, who has believed our report? To whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Well, the answer is, not a whole lot. Therefore, they could not believe. So they would not and they kept progressing in that willful disobedience and willful unbelief to the point where they are going to fulfill the prophecy that we just read. Because Isaiah said again, he has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts, lest they should see with their eyes, lest they should understand with their hearts, and turn so that I should heal them. Okay, Brother Scott, I, you have totally lost me. I thought this was a Christmas series. Where is, where are the angels? I don't, I don't understand. I'm so glad that you're confused. And I'm so glad that you're bothered because I want you to look at the next verse. He's just quoted Isaiah, right? And John the Apostle is telling us who Isaiah saw. These things Isaiah said when he saw his glory and spoke of him. Now the question is, who is the him? Let me answer it. Isaiah saw Jesus. So all of those descriptions of who Jesus is, of who God is in that Isaiah 6 passage, John tells us that's Jesus. He shares all those qualities, all of those characteristics. Jesus is holy, holy, holy. Before Bethlehem, he was holy, 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 eternally in his birth, virgin born, Holy Spirit birth, holy, 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 all through his entire life. His, his, his hands, his heart, his motives, his mouth, his lips were always clean. Every single one word that Jesus even thought about as a man was in the will of God. And when he died, he was holy, holy, holy. You need to understand that Isaiah was seeing a pre-Bethlehem vision of the Lord Jesus. This is what Jesus left to come to this earth, folks. As you see Isaiah 6 and you see this exalted, glorious, wonderful being who's been worshipped by the seraphim. The, the temple can't even hold his robes. And this being was willing to set that kind of glory aside and come to earth as a little baby. The temple couldn't, couldn't contain his robes and he put on our robe of flesh. 
and had to learn how to walk and had to learn how to talk and he had to go to school. This is who Jesus is. This is what he did. He left the thundering voices who were around the throne, thundering voices in eternity past saying, Jesus, you're holy, you're holy, you're holy, so he could come to earth and the Jews could say, I don't know who you are. And the Romans could say, you confuse me. And he could hear the words, crucify, crucify, crucify. That's Christmas, folks. This is who Jesus is. This is what Jesus has done. This God so immense and so overwhelming that his glory fills the whole earth will condescend so far and live in my heart. And all I can say is wow. Glory. He is so different from us. He is holy, holy, holy. So two things you need to do. Number one, don't use the excuse of your sin and the fear of God's holiness to keep you from coming to him. Here's the thing that Isaiah is teaching us and was was teaching them and is teaching us. Look, if Isaiah could find grace and mercy and forgiveness, so can we. He is uncomprehensibly holy, but he's also incomprehensibly good and loving and gracious and kind. It doesn't matter who we are, where we've been. It doesn't matter how long we've said no. Say yes to him. Come to him. And what you'll find is grace and mercy and forgiveness. Let the holiness of Jesus purge and cleanse your sin. And think about, and it's not going to be some seraphim flying around with an emblematic coal off the altar. No, it's going to be the shed blood and body of Jesus on the cross. Secondly, if he's healed you and saved you, respond to his call. We are called to go and to tell. We are called to surrender our lives to this Jesus. Now, most people will not listen, but you know what? Some will We need to go and tell. Well, Christmas with Isaiah begins with this truth. God is holy, holy, holy. Jesus is holy, holy, holy. Why don't you stand with me? Let's pray together. Father, I ask you in the name of Jesus to save those who need saving this morning. Help us to see you for all that you are. Help us to see more clearly who we are. Help us to see just how good and wonderful and awesome and gracious and kind and loving Jesus is. Father, I, I want to I wanna just stop right here as an act of worship. Father, take all of me for all of you, for the rest of my life. Help us, Lord, as a congregation, as a church, just to lay ourselves at your altar. Help us to respond to the holiness that you've shown us. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's let's sing. Holy, holy, Lord God Almighty, early in the morning our song shall rise to Thee, holy, holy, holy.
wonderful holy God. 